Okay. So, um, we are on chapter 37, Death of a High Mass Star. So, real heavy stars, if they get about 8 or 10 times as heavy as our sun, um, they, uh, they die differently. Remember, our sun is going to expand and expand, and then it becomes a red giant, and then the gases just go off into space. Y'all remember that? Yes. And what was left, 10 points if you can tell me, what would have been left in the it. center of our sun after all the gases go off into space? What's what that called? 10 I, points. I have no idea what he said. What he said. 10 points, what is that? I'm sorry, can you repeat it? Our sun, when it dies, all the gases are going to get, our sun's going to grow into a red giant, and then all the gases are going to disperse into space. Yes. What's going to be left in the center? Wait, 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 wait. Are you asking? Um, not right around for Peach. There's a, there's a name of what's left in the center. Okay, just go. Yes! Blue crack. Anyone else? No, it, I think you uh, right. Wait, wait. We're coming. Can I say something to add to it or something? I don't know. You can say something different. Going. Wait. Not right or wrong. Not right or wrong. Not right or wrong. The only one that got it was. White dwarf. Oh, were you? Were you blue. I think... Yeah, 10 more points for blue. A white dwarf. Ah! A white right. dwarf star. <laughs> hey, hey, look. Look what's right. scratched out on the orange sheet. So, a white away. dwarf is composed of mostly carbon. However, if the star is big enough, there is more gravity. So here's at the end of our sun's life, it'll be like this. Helium on the outside, and then... I'm sorry, hydrogen on the outside, helium, and then helium, and, and then carbon in the center. At this point, the star just kind of comes apart, and you're left with the carbon center, which is called a white dwarf. It's a white dwarf star, but it doesn't do fusion like a normal star. It's just a hot ball of carbon sitting there floating around in space. And, uh, and it glows because it's hot, and so that's called a white dwarf star. It's very different than most stars. However, if the star is much bigger, there's a lot more gravity and there's enough gravity to make that carbon fuse into other elements. So other elements larger than carbon, if you remember your chemistry, there are elements larger than carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, phosphorus, chlorine, just all these other elements start building up inside the carbon core. And because carbon is fusing to form those bigger elements, and you end up with many more layers you end up with a layer of oxygen and carbon, a layer of oxygen, neon, and magnesium, a layer of silicon, and it'll just keep fusing and fusing. There's, these stars have so much gravity, they'll keep fusing until they reach iron. And iron will not fuse no matter how much gravity the star has. Iron will not fuse into, into larger elements. So iron is the end point of stellar evolution. Uh, once you get to iron, you're done. Yes? So what about when you said it's just like a diamond floating in its like space? The carbon ball is, yep. So you consider that a white dwarf? That's, that is a white dwarf. So a diamond is, the diamond is the white dwarf? Well, the white dwarf is made of mostly carbon. There are some other elements, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. It's pretty cool, isn't it? It's a ball of carbon the size of the Earth. Floating around in space, white dwarf. And so finally, we form this carbon core. And at that point, the red giant is so big that it could be called a super giant. What? What is going on? Typical no. unbelievable. Do we want to pause it? No. Do it live. Charlie's face, I was like it zooming into him, and you were like right there at it. <laughs> Next period starts at like 12.15, right? Something like that. Why you, why you fool like that? I think so, because it's 45 minute classes, so it's like 12.20. Mr. Willis? Yeah? Um, what's the test of your day in marine biology? Because I got it, 
So at this point we call it a red super giant. And Beetlejuice, do y'all recognize Orion? Beetlejuice is the Beetlejuice brightest. Beetlejuice right there is a red super giant. It's a star, it's a giant star that's dying. And it probably has has all those different elements at its center right now. Let's watch the movie, the Beetlejuice movie later. Uh, Not now. No. Nah. It's a great one. Know. It's a great one. But once we reach you seen Iron, you seen that movie? there's a problem. Pay attention here. You're gonna learn why how why a star blows up. Once you reach Iron in the core, there's a problem. When Iron is in the core, there's no more fusion going on in the core because Iron can't fuse. So there's gravity pulling in, but nothing pushing out. And then you have a problem for your iron atoms. They cannot hold up the rest of the star. They're not that strong. So what happens is the iron atoms collapse. Do y'all remember that an atom consists of a nucleus in the middle and electrons going around it? Do y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. Amy, pay attention here. An atom has a nucleus in the middle and electrons going around it. And this electron creates the outside of the atom. It creates a barrier. So this would be one iron atom, and, and here would be another right next to it. And here would be another down here. And the reason why they, and they, they, can't, they can't gum together is because these electron shells. The electrons are going around it, supporting the atom, causing the, the outside of the atom. Well... When there's enough gravity collapsing in, pushing in, there's nothing to, uh, th these electron uh, shells cannot support that much weight. So what happens is the whole star collapses and these iron nuclei all come together and the electrons <laughs> push into the nucleus. So what I've drawn here, these three big atoms are reduced to this. Imagine those two nuclei and that nuclei all together. Bam, bam, bam. And all the electrons in here are now in there, in the atoms. And do you know what you get if you combine an electron and a proton that's in the nucleus? A neutron? A neutron. So all the protons in the nucleus combine with the electrons that are going around them and form neutrons. In the entire middle of the star, that might be the size of the Earth, collapses into a bunch of neutrons that sit in the very center of the star. Imagine the entire Earth collapsing to a size of about St. Simon's in a millisecond. It happens like that. Boom. You know what that causes the star to do? It causes it to explode. Whoa. By something called the rebound effect, which is really cool. Now, remember, this, this thing collapses, and there's other stuff on top of it. There's silicon and oxygen and helium and hydrogen all on top of it pushing down. Imagine the center of this thing breaking down and becoming real small, and everything else on top of it falls down. And it hits the center and bounces back. I'm going to show you a model of how that works, and this is going to blow your mind, because you've never seen any of this cool, because your life is, is not very complete yet, but you'll probably remember. Oh, yeah, he's got a basketball. Where is... There's a tennis ball. Did you see a tennis ball? Somebody was playing with it. Somebody was playing with it? Me? <laughs> okay. So here is, watch this now. Are you watching Santana? Yes. Here's a basketball falling. Nice. Here's a tennis ball falling. They're going to hit it at the same right? time. Okay. Now, if you have heavy stuff on the bottom and lighter stuff on top of it, just like we have in this situation here, and it all goes falling down to the center, and then it hits an unmovable force, like our floor. Here's what, here's what situation you get. Watch this. You ready? 
Oh shoot! <laughs> it was T, don't worry. Let me go again, let me show it to you. No, time, time out. What? Hold that. Are you filming? Yes. <laughs> See how dangerous it is? Yeah, if I took my face out. It took <laughs> Let's watch again. Let me shoot, see if I can shoot it over there. See if you can catch this. Drop it, Alistair. Oh, yeah! Good shot, to Alistair. Here you go. So, this is what happens in the star. This is a supernova. Because there's iron at the center, let's go over it again. Because there's iron at the center, it can't fuse anymore. Its electron clouds cannot support the atom anymore. There's too much pressure pushing down. Because there's no fusion pushing out. There's just gravity pulling in. And the atoms collapse all down into neutrons in the middle. And you're left with a neutron core. And everything falls down on that neutron core and then bounces back. Like this tennis ball flying away from the star. But it, it flies away in all directions. And so, but imagine that, multiply that by a trillion, because this stuff is a lot heavier than this tennis ball and this ball. like, it's perfectly and, um, and what you'll get... Oh, we were doing, you want to see this? See Hold this. on, you don't want to see I, this. Wait, the door opens with Chris. This is a supernova Be careful, it comes that way. So, that's how a super, that's a model of how a supernova happens. There's heavy material... It was lighter material on top of it, That's all falling to the center of a star, you and you that. get a rebound effect where all this stuff blows away and gets sent out into space. That's why you get that weird, I mean, oval. Yeah, well, it looks like this right here. Here's a picture of a supernova that, remnant. Yeah. yeah, these are supernova remnants taken with our telescopes, and all this material is the rest of the star. And it's flies out into space, and all these elements that were inside the star are now flying out into space. So is it like different kind of colors in each layer? Like, are the, when it shoots out, does it layer? Like the colors layer layers out? There are that go shooting out, but the color is not due to the, the, the atoms. The color is due to temperature. Do you remember that? Yes, yeah, sir. And some of these pictures are false color, but the hotter temperatures are... Uh, are uh, red and the, I mean, the hotter temperatures are blue and White the cooler and temperatures blue. are red. Um, and it also has to do with, remember the reddening effect that we talked about? Yes, yeah, sir. And all that. So there's a lot of things going on with the colors. But there's something else you also need to know is that when this rebound effect happens, one more time, the, the atoms that are flying through space hit each other. And they hit each other with such force that they will fuse and form even larger elements than iron. And so that's where all the other elements on in the world comes from. All the heavy stuff. Gold and platinum and silver and all that stuff. Amy, hang with me. Mm -hmm. All the heavier elements that are on the periodic table that you don't find a whole lot of, they're kind of rare, they all come from supernova explosions where this material, all these atoms that are flying off, hit each other and fuse and form these larger elements. This is where all the stuff in the world comes from. The reason why we have all the elements that we do on this planet is from a supernova explosion that happened about six billion years ago. And all that stuff in, that, in those clouds that were left in space, all this stuff right here, came back together to form our sun and our solar system and, and us. Do supernovas run into each other so that you're getting mixing of elements from two different... Sometimes they do, yep. Yeah, sometimes they can. And so this stuff will fly out at, at huge speeds, and it can run into others, right. another supernova, and even cause, even cause uh, more activity. So, yeah, that's a lot of stuff. Y'all want to see video footage? We do, uh, yes. Video Who footage doesn't? of a Always. supernova explosion. Dude, that was crazy. I still cannot believe that thing. He, like, snipered my... Yeah. My tea. Here it goes.
that was dramatic. But this is an actual picture that we see now with our telescopes. It's called the Crab Nebula. See, it says Crab Supernova Explosion. That's the Crab Nebula, and it can be seen with the Hubble Space Telescope. And um, that, that came from a supernova that happened in about 1030 AD. Wow. Happened about 1,000 years ago. And, uh, and now this is what it looks like. So for a thousand years it's been expanding, and Chinese astronomers wrote about a bright light that they saw in the sky, a star that appeared in the sky, and it was so bright you could see it in the daytime. It was a daytime star, and it lasted about two weeks, and it was from a supernova explosion, this one, that happened, and you saw this star, they didn't know what it was, it's real far away, so it can't affect us, but it could be, it was so bright it could be seen from hundreds of light years away, and uh, thousands of light years away, and um, and this is what's left of it now. Beautiful. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. It's called the Crab Nebula. And they call it a nebula because it's a bunch of gas and dust in space. But um, supernovas are the biggest explosions in the galaxy. They give off a big burst because they're so hot, they give off a big burst of gamma rays. And if you train your uh, gamma ray detectors into space, you'll just see flashes. They're called gamma ray bursters. And they just go off. And we, they're so far away, we don't even know where they're coming from. But they're from galaxies that are thousands and millions of light years away, and uh, even billions of light years away. And you just see this little flash. And it's gamma rays that have been flying through space for billions of years and have finally reached us and you see the little flash. And they can detect those with these gamma ray detectors. So is it possible that something is, uh, some supernova has gone off this year we just don't know it's so far away? Yeah, because they're so far away it takes a long time to reach us. But supernovas are rare. You would expect one to happen in our galaxy about every hundred years. One happens in the Milky Way every hundred years. So we don't see much of them. And if it was on the other side of the Milky Way, we wouldn't see it at all. This, this one actually was in our galaxy. And that's why it was so bright, you could see it. But we can see them happening in other galaxies. They're so bright, they outshine the other galaxy completely. A supernova will outshine the galaxy that it's in. So you can, you can see supernovas are a lot brighter than the galaxies that they're in. And so you'll see supernovas around space from other galaxies, and there's so many other galaxies we can we can see them every a few every year, four, five, six, seven every year from other galaxies. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Supernova, baby. And okay, so what's left at the center of the supernova? Is there anything left? Does it blow everything up? It doesn't. What's left is this ball of neutrons. We call it a neutron star. It's a big ball of neutrons that sits in space. It's a, like I say, it's about the size of St. Simon's. But it's pure neutrons. There's no electrons floating around atoms. It is just a big ball of neutrons. It's like a big atomic nucleus. And it is so dense and so heavy that it's like nothing we have here. A, a, a tennis ball worth of this material would weigh more than Mount Everest. It's incredibly dense. It's way denser than anything we have on Earth here because all the atoms we have on Earth have electrons around them and don't allow them to get this dense. There's no electrons going around these, at these nuclei. It's like a giant nucleus floating in space. It's just neutrons. And uh, man, it's heavy. It's got so much gravity that if you went near it, it'd suck you in, and it would flatten you to it. Um, this this ball of neutrons just floating around in space. If you got near it, um, it would pull you down and flatten you thinner than this sheet of paper in just a matter of seconds, a matter of milliseconds, and 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 it would it would kill you, obviously. Space. If you were flatter than that sheet of paper, you space. wouldn't be alive. Space can kill you. And they spin really fast, and they have really strong magnetic fields because of their spin. You can imagine if you were at the center of a star that blew up, you'd be spinning one way or another. There's a lot of force there in the explosion. And so these things are really cool objects. They can get spinning really fast. 
And like I said, they have magnetic fields. And the magnetic fields cause bipolar jets to come out of them. Whenever material goes near it, a lot of the material gets shot out of these bipolar jets. And so you end up with something called a pulsar. Let me show you how a pulsar works. Imagine the spinning object. You come through here. Imagine the spinning. I have to get a spinning chair to do this. We turn the light on on my phone. Spinning object. This is another cool thing that you'll see. Hello. Come on. Yeah. Is it on? Okay, here we go. So imagine this. Imagine I'm spinning around like this. Every once in a while the light is hitting you, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So we call this the lighthouse effect. Pulsars have what's called a lighthouse effect. They spin around, and what you see, if you're looking at it in space, is a blink, 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 every time it spins around once. And that's called the lighthouse effect. So it kind of looks like this. It's a spinning neutron star. There it is. And when scientists first saw this, they thought it was aliens trying to communicate with us. Because it was blinking in a pattern, and they had never seen anything like it through their telescopes. And uh, they actually named the first object they saw LGM and gave it a number, LGM-001, something like that. And LGM stood for Little Green Men. <laughs> and they, didn't, they thought it was might be aliens contacting us. And then they figured out it was just a regular pattern. It wasn't any kind of code or anything. And uh, they figured out what it was. It was a neutron star spinning around. You want to see video footage of a neutron star spinning around? Heck yes. yeah. Chris wants to see video footage of a neutron star spinning around. Yeah. Neutron yeah. stars are amongst the most powerful objects in our galaxy. They are so dense that they have a gravitational pull of such strength that if anything strays too close, it is dragged onto the star with extreme force. A neutron star is typically just a few miles across and will have a mass as great as the sun. So the densities are just enormous. Um, if you... Uh, dropped a uh, marshmallow onto a neutron star, it would have the energy of an atomic bomb because the gravity is so powerful. Neutron stars seemed to contain enough energy to produce these gamma ray bursts. The only question was, what was actually triggering them? There were a number of ideas relating to neutron stars specifically. The idea was you drop something out of the neutron star and it releases a lot of energy. One idea was an asteroid uh, falling onto a neutron star. It soon became the accepted theory that neutron stars fired off these bursts of gamma rays if something collided with them. The mystery seemed to be solved. Now they had the answer. Everyone began to speculate about the possible impact of these bursts on Earth. It began to dawn on them that if these explosions were coming from our... They're talking about something else that, uh, that I just wanted to show you the neutron star. I didn't want to get into what, how they investigated these gamma ray bursts. They found out the gamma ray bursts aren't from uh, neutron stars. They're from black holes. Whoa. Whoa. So what is a black hole? Probably not. It's two neutron stars. <laughs> well, imagine this neutron star, this incredibly dense thing. 
Is there a point at which, remember, a dense thing like that has gravity pulling in, but nothing pushing out if there's no fusion going on. So they found out that the laws of physics state that these neutrons cannot hold themselves against gravity forever. If there's enough gravity pulling in, that is, if the neutron star is big enough, it too will collapse. Gravity will pull it inward on itself. And it will collapse down to nothing. And that nothing is a point in space called a singularity. And this is where things start to get really weird Whoa. and don't make sense to scientists very much. A singularity is a tiny point in space at which the, is the most dense possible state. And even a neutron star, the neutrons cannot hold themselves against the pressure of gravity and they will collapse down to an infinitesimally small point, smaller than the nucleus of an atom, smaller than a proton, an infinitely small point, which doesn't make sense to physicists. But we know these things are out there. They can detect them. And when everything falls to that small point, there's so much gravity in that point that light itself cannot escape. So if light is trying to come, come past this point, light will be pulled into the, to this point, to the singularity. And what that means is that light can't go through it. So you've got an area of space that is black. That's a black hole. And black holes are real. They're out there. And that's what one would look like. We, we never got close enough to one to actually see it. But that's what one would look like. A black area of space from which light cannot escape. But light can go past it going around it. Light can go past it this way, but it just can't go in that area. That area right there, from the singularity out to the edge of the black hole, is... Uh, is called um, uh, the Schwarzschild radius. The Schwarzschild radius marks the radius of the black hole. And the more stuff that falls into a black hole, the bigger the Schwarzschild radius gets. So it wouldn't have anything surrounded like in the picture. It would just be yeah, no, it could have stuff around it. This is stuff being pulled in by gravity falling into it. And as it gets pulled in, it heats up and gets bright and gives off light, which can escape because it's not in the black hole. But that stuff will eventually fall into the black hole, making the black hole bigger. And this is how we detect black holes, by measuring the stuff around it, how fast this stuff is going. By measuring how fast the stuff around it is going, we can get an idea of how much gravity there is there. We can know if it's a black hole or not, and not just a heavy star or a planet. Yeah. What happens? to something that gets sucked into a black hole? They don't really know, but there are theoretical things. They know that that, uh, that it would get flattened out as it falls in. Remember tidal forces stretch out a moon? Uh -huh. You Anything falling into a black hole would get stretched out. And would get stretched out into, it's, it, they call it, it, actually the word is spaghetti, spaghettified, because it's like made into spaghetti. It gets stretched out into long strings of atoms, and you would end up, if you could imagine your body just getting stretched out into atoms, your feet would get pulled away from the rest of your body and, and your, everything would get stretched out into atoms and you would go into this black hole as a long string of atoms and even the atoms themselves, when they get close enough to the black hole, get pulled apart into their constituents and you end up with a string of matter and as, you, and as gravity gets more and more, the matter comes apart and becomes energy and it all goes into this black hole and it never comes out again and, and just makes the black hole bigger so black holes can grow in size. They think that at the center of all galaxies is a supermassive black hole. And we've seen that we've measured uh, stuff going around the one in the center of the Milky Way. A supermassive black hole where the Schwarzschild radius is so big that it would stretch all the way out to the orbit of uh, Saturn, maybe, or Neptune, if it were where our sun is. This giant black hole is at the center of our galaxy, sucking everything. How far is away? How far is that away from us? Yeah. 20, uh, um, tw uh, about 30,000 light years. Okay. That's a long ways away from us, but we can see it with our radio telescope. So are we, we can't see it. We can see stuff going around it and measure the speed of the stuff going around. Are we slowly being sucked in? No, because you can orbit. 
we can, we can be in orbit. So the only things that get sucked in are things that are going towards it and get too close. Then those get pulled in. But, but if you're going, you can be going away from it and be spiraling, getting farther and farther away, just like any, and you can be in a perfect orbit and just be staying the same. And that's about what we're in. As it grows, though? As it grows, it could suck more and more stuff. That's true, and, and change things. But gravity works kind of like magnets do. You know, when magnets are real close together, there's a strong connection. And when they're far from one another, there's not, in the same way with black holes and with anything that has gravity, it's uh, the further away you get, the, the less effect it has on you. But everything in the galaxy is orbiting this central point. <laughs> Spaghettified. It's a great term. Um, this is material. This is we call the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. We call it. Uh, that's the symbol for it. It's pronounced Sag A star. Sag A star is because it's in the direction of the Sagittarius constellation. There's a point that everything is going around at a fast speed and they've determined that right at that point is a supermassive black hole. They're trying to make telescopes big enough to actually image a black hole. There are some black holes near us, not near enough to, to threaten us or anything like that, but near enough where we might be able to see them with a big enough telescope. And so they're working on that. Another way to detect black holes is by something called gravitational lensing. If a, if a, this is a black hole, this is an artist painting or video of a black hole going in front of a galaxy. Here's the galaxy, this thing's a galaxy, and this is the black hole near, nearer to us than that galaxy. And you can see the light from that galaxy be, being lensed around the black hole because the black hole uh, curves light. As light comes from that galaxy, it'll curve around the black hole. The black hole has gravity enough to curve light and create this what we call lensing effect. And so that's another way you can spot black holes by the lensing that they do on faraway things. You can't see the black hole itself, but you can see this, this material being lensed in space. And we have lots of pictures of material being lensed, and we know from that that there's black holes. Isn't this amazing? Mm -hmm. Scary. Mm -hmm. Oh, and there's another term you need to know. The uh, the outside of a black hole is called has a cool name. It's called the event horizon. Have you ever heard that word? The event horizon is the outer edge of a black hole. That's another thing. Event horizon. There was a cool movie called Event Horizon about black holes. You can rent it as sci-fi movie. You ever heard of this guy? Yeah. Stephen Hawking. The reason why he's so famous is he did work on black holes. And he found out mathematically that black holes actually fizzle out over billions and trillions of years. Now, nothing can escape a black hole except what's called Hawking radiation, which arises because of effects in something called quantum physics, which we won't get into really in this class. But there's actual ways that radiation can jump from one point to another. It's called a quantum effect. And it causes black holes to actually release some radiation from the middle of the black hole, even though you would think that's impossible. By normal relativistic laws, it is. But by the laws of quantum physics, radiation can escape. And over trillions of years, a black hole, if it's not fed anything, will fizzle away. And so all black holes will eventually disappear, according to Stephen Hawking. Uh, I wouldn't want to argue with him. He's one of the smartest people that ever lived. They say his IQ is like 180 or 190, something just amazing. And you can watch his movies about his life. There was one that came out recently. The Theory of Everything? The Theory of Everything, yeah. And he was a pretty, pretty amazing guy. He has Lou Gehrig's disease, and he's kind of wasting away. Um, uh, with his with his musculature, but it doesn't affect his mind, and so he can think, but he just can't move his muscles. And uh, he uses the wheelchair, you know, and uses a computer to speak through. And but he he writes books in his head, and uh, uses a computer to kind of type them up. And he's 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 a pretty amazing guy. Um, and a lot of people say he might be one of the smartest people that ever lived. So he did he did work on black holes. 
Um, so all of this stuff in this chapter, I went over it real fast because I knew we had a short period today. But all this stuff is really neat. So, so go back over and spend some more time with it. Um, and uh, that's what this section is going to be on tomorrow. Tomorrow? I mean, uh, tomorrow. When is it? Monday. Monday. Jim and Charlie. Okay? Yeah. All right, we're good.